What's up, you guys? Dr. Gooden back with another lecture video covering the second half of chapter 16 in the CSCS textbook. In this video, we'll be talking about variable modes of resistance training. So bands, chains, and other fun stuff like that. Dr. Gooden here back with another lecture. Oh, yeah. At the bell. Here we go. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, Professor of Kinesiology here at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, we'll be covering the second half of Chapter 16, all about variable resistance training methods. And we'll also look at some non-traditional exercise techniques. Okay, let's jump right into it. This chapter was written by Drs. Hoff and Berninger, and it was published by the NSCA. So first, we have to define some different types of resistance. The first is constant external resistance. This is the most common method for applying resistance in weight training, and it's represented by traditional methods such as free weights. The external load remains constant, as implied by the name, throughout the full range of motion and better represents real life activities. So when you lift a barbell, the weight of the barbell doesn't change as you're lifting it. And when you lift a dumbbell, the weight of that dumbbell doesn't change. The, the resistance, the external resistance is constant because gravity and the mass that you're lifting is constant. Now, that doesn't mean that the exercise is the same level of difficulty throughout the range of motion because based on biomechanics and the way that our body move, moves and the leverages of our joints, there will be what we call a sticking point, which is the, the weakest part of the lift, the hardest part, and you'll have other areas of strength throughout the lift. For instance, in a squat, the sticking point is maybe about a third of the way up from the bottom and you're really strong at the top of the squat. That's why the gym bros, when they try to unrack more than they can squat, they only do quarter squats, they don't do full squats. Uh, it's because you're the strongest at the top of it. So it doesn't mean that there's not um, a strong part of the lift and a weaker part of the lift, but what it does mean is that the actual external resistance is constant throughout. Now we also have what's called accommodating resistance, and this can also be called semi-isokinetic resistance. This allows for the speed of movement or the isokinetic resistance to be controlled throughout the full range of motion. It may not provide adequate training stimulus when compared to traditional training methods. And this is just in direct comparison in the literature. We don't always see that it provides a better stimulus. Accommodating resistance um, actually changes the amount of force, of external force required to move the load or to complete the lift. Now, some different methods for incorporating accommodating resistance include things like bands or chains, where you can overload the top of the movement while making the bottom of the movement, let's say in a squat, for instance, easier. So we know that the sticking point of the squat is usually either in the hole or about one third of the way up. So if we make that part of the squat easier and the top of the squat harder where you're stronger, now we might get a more even strength curve throughout the range of motion of the lift. If you remember the old sort of Nautilus machines back in the day that used um, uh, specifically uh, engineered cam devices, they're like kind of oval in shape instead of perfectly cylindrical for the belts to, to move on those machines and for those levers, it actually changes the force curve of the movement so that for any movement, whether it's pressing or squatting or bicep curl or whatever, at the weakest part of the lift, uh, you feel less resistance. And at the strongest point of the lift, you feel more resistance. And so this is a way to maybe more evenly train through, that, um, through the strength curve of the movement. Variable resistance is kind of another way to say the same thing as accommodating resistance, although accommodating tends to mean um, that you increase the difficulty of the lift at your strongest point. I suppose with variable resistance, you could increase the difficulty of the lift at the weakest point, although people tend not to do that because what's the point if you then just have to, you know, fail the lift at the weak point or undertrain your strong point? Um, anyways, we um, so we would use bands or chains in barbell movements in order to accomplish this. Um, there are other things as well, such as uh, the slingshot that Mark Bell uh, made popular or maybe invented, I don't remember, but he, let's say he invented it to give him credit. Um, for benching, right? It's this big elastic thing that goes between your um, arms. It loops around your upper arm. And then as you are benching and pulling the bar down, it spreads across your chest and acts as a passive elastic form of um, energy return. So it's like a second set of pecs essentially. And as you bring that weight down, it's stretching out, storing that elastic energy. And then when you 
press off, it gives you all of that extra force right at lift off, but then you still have to lock it out mostly with your triceps. So it's a great way to unload the chest muscles or to overload the triceps muscles when you're bench pressing. So that's a form of variable or accommodating resistance. Um, for chain supplemented exercises, uh, it's important to know that different, not all changes are this, not all chains are the same, different chain uh, lengths and weights have different effects on the bar. So it's determined by the structure, density, length, and diameter of the chain used, although typically I just weigh the chain. Um, with chains, if you dangle the entire chain from the bar, then every time one of those links of chain hits the ground, it's unloading the bar by that amount of mass. Whereas if you, if you hang the chains really low so that they're in a bunch, then when that bunch hits the ground as you're squatting downwards, then that entire mass of chain is unloaded. Um, let's say if you're doing it with a deadlift, again, if you drape the chain over the deadlift, then as you lift it, every single link that comes off the ground adds mass to the bar on the way up. Whereas if you have the chain dangling in a mass, then the deadlift is easy and then all of a sudden it gets a lot harder as that mass of chains is lifted into the air. So what you can do is you can go to the bottom of the movement um, and the top of the movement and measure the mass. So you, let's say the entire chain is unloaded at the bottom and the entire chain is loaded at the top. And let's say that the chain it adds 30 pounds and you have two chains. So that's gonna be 60 pounds at the top and zero pounds of chain at the bottom. And let's say that the bar weight is 135 like that. And so I think you can see where we're going. We get 165 at the top. Oh, sorry, not 165. 195 at the top and 135 at the bottom. And we take the average between those and we get 165. Now chains should only be used by individuals who have good stable technique already. And this is because they're gonna swing around, they're gonna introduce some other forces into the mix that you have to stabilize against. So it's important for the athlete to know how to do the movement without the chains first pretty well and have solid technique. Now with resistance bands, it's a similar concept. You loop the band around the bar and then anchor it to something on the ground. And that will provide an overloading resistance more at the top or you could use a reverse band technique where you hook the band to something above on the rack and then to the bar. And what this does is as the bar is lowered, the band is actually unloading some of the bar's weight. And as you go lower and lower into your squat or your bench, more of the bar's weight is supported. And this is actually a more stable technique to use because the band is actually helping you to stabilize the bar versus if you have the the band looped over the bar and then anchored on the floor, then sometimes it can get kind of weird as you unrack the bar and step backwards and it can kind of throw you off because it's literally, it's like pulling you into position instead of supporting you from the top. So both, um, I would say the difference differences are negligible. If you want a deep dive into, into reverse bands versus traditional band setup, check out the video that Dr. Mike Isretel just put out on it. He goes a lot deeper into the nuances there, but. Both of them are modes of variable resistance training. Now, in order to calculate the actual resistance that we're feeling, we can use Hooke's law, which is the, uh, says that tension equals stiffness times deformation. It's important to remember though that two supposedly equal bands can have a difference in the amount of tension that you feel from them. So uh, it's been tested and found that between 3.2 to 5.2% to uh, difference between two supposedly equal bands. Now one type of variable resistance training that I did want to cover but it's not mentioned here in the text is accentuated eccentric loading or AEL training and AEL training involves additional load on the way down or on the eccentric portion of a movement that is then somehow pops off the bar or, or is somehow unloaded uh, for the concentric portion. And it requires the use of either a special tool or a training partner or special devices, but it could be a really great method for busting through plateaus or, or potentially overloading highly trained athletes that might not experience um, an overload with traditional strength training. And it might also lead to faster strength gains with um, just about any type of athlete. 
I say might because there's still a lot of research to be done, but it seems uh, like the preliminary literature is saying that you know this could be a really, really good tool. So you can do it a number of different ways. Uh, they have weight releasers that you can purchase, which are essentially like massive hooks that you dangle extra weight onto. And then as you're squatting, you have all of that weight on the bar on the way down. And as you hit the bottom of your squat, the big hooks pop off the bar with a loud clang and suddenly the bar is a lot lighter. So you can pop up with a lot less mass on the bar. So you could go down with say 110% of your 1RM, that weight pops off the bar right at the bottom. And now you come up quickly with say 70%. Then we might get some sort of a potentiation effect there as well. So that's a that's a really cool looking way to train and it's novel, but it might actually present a, a really great stimulus for strength and for power as well. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some non-traditional uh, implement training methods. So tire flips, keg presses, log presses, those types of things. Um, they are gaining in popularity in part because they're just so fun to do and it provides a break from the monotony of continual barbell and dumbbell type training. Um, there's not been a lot of research done on these in relation to transfer of training to different sports. Uh, most of these implements are taken out of strongman training programs. And so we might think automatically that, oh, if a strongman is using them, then they're going to transfer over and make our athletes stronger. I would say that uh, we need to wait for the literature to come out and for more studies to be done um, in order to say that yes, 100% of the time that's true. But logically, we know that on the field, on, in the court, our athletes are experiencing the, the chaos of the game, the unpredictability of forces that they encounter. And so I think it could be a very good idea logically if we implement in a safe way some degree of odd object or, or asymmetrical implement training with our athletes. So with strongman training, some of the, the primary uh, moves that have made their way into the strength and conditioning world are tire flipping, which, you know, it just looks cool. Like, you know, you saw uh, the actors for that movie 300, like flipping tires and then getting totally jacked for the movie. Like, it just looks cool to do tire flips. I think that's probably one of the least uh, sports specific uh, types of strength training that we should be doing just because it involves such a low squat to get to the ground. Um, and maybe for football athletes, it could be a really good movement. But a tire flip, essentially, you wanna be careful that you're not, that your athlete has enough mobility to get all the way to the ground, uh, to lift that tire up, that the tire is not um, heavier than something that they could deadlift, of course, and probably not even approaching, you know, 70 or 80% of what they could deadlift because they have to get into that uncomfortable, potentially uh, injurious position of rounded back, really low squat to get it up and then um, drive their knee forward, switch their hands and then push it over. We also have log lifting, which I talked about, I think in the previous video, it's like a clean and jerk, but a brute force clean and jerk on a giant log. So you can imagine how it could put you in some precarious situations as far as spinal stability, um, wrist and elbow and shoulder stability, those types of things. And then finally, the one that I think is, mo is used most often, the one that I use most often in my training as far as odd object uh, training is farmer's walks. And you can just do these with dumbbells and kettlebells. This is just carrying something heavy over a certain distance. And the reason I like these so much is because it trains the uh, upper traps and upper back, the shoulders, the forearm muscles. And if you get the athletes to really focus on standing tall, their postural muscles as well. And even some of their pelvic stabilizers as they're walking with these very heavy loads. You can do it, like I said, dumbbells, barbells with um, loaded carry handles. You could do it with a trap bar. Uh, the athlete just deadlifts the bar up and then walks. Really, really great movements. Now, another form of non-traditional implement training is kettlebell training. And I would say since this book was written about eight to 10 years ago, they have become much more traditional in pretty much every weight room. You see at least a couple of kettlebells, if not a full set of them. So I would call them traditional by this point. Um, but essentially it's like, it looks like a, a, a cannon shot with a handle on it and that's a kettlebell. And the primary way that we use kettlebells, especially in training for athletes, is just with a kettlebell swing, right? Because it develops good posterior chain strength and power to do kettlebell swings and even like power endurance to do swings um, in upwards of 10, 15, 20 repetitions, but to do it powerfully and explosively every single time. Uh, I really like them for that reason, especially if the athlete doesn't know how to do Olympic lifts or maybe has uh, some trouble with 
um, deadlifting heavy, we can do heavy kettlebell swings if they have good technique and it's a great reactive and explosive movement for the posterior chain. Um, you can also use them for cardiovascular fitness, uh, metabolic conditioning type activities. We've seen it popularized by CrossFit, although I really don't like the kettlebell overhead type movements. It's fine, I guess, with, with lighter weight kettlebells, um, but then you're just limiting what your lower body is able to output. So I just like the typical kettlebell swing. There's all, all kinds of ways to get fancy with it though. And it's important to remember that kettlebells are, kettlebells they have their own like sport kettlebell sport culture associated with them. So like a kettlebell clean to press or kettlebell snatch, like, yeah, sure. We can use them as a variation in training, but they're not inherently better than something else like a traditional snatch or a traditional barbell clean and press, but they do offer interesting alternatives and they're still external load and we can still develop strength and power using kettlebells. Now, when selecting kettlebells, there um, there are either fixed or adjustable load kettlebells. I don't think we need to go too deep into that. It's kind of like a loadable dumbbell versus a fixed dumbbell. We do need to consider the shape of the handle of the kettlebell, though. The diameter of the handle could affect the grip. So if it's too thick on like a really heavy kettlebell, then maybe some of our smaller or our female athletes wouldn't be able to hold on to it. Um, sometimes the diameter of the handle makes it hard. Like, for instance, at home, I have a heavy kettlebell that my wife and I use. It's like an 80 pounder and, it, and it's great for heavy swings, but the diameter of the handle is so small because the handle is so thick that I can't actually get both of my hands in there comfortably. And so um, it, I don't feel like I have the firmest grip on it. So that's important as well. All right, <clears throat> next we need to talk about unilateral training. Um, again, this I don't think of this as non-traditional but the textbook puts it there. So we're gonna talk about it there in this chapter. Um, I think unilateral training can and should be used in the majority of our athletes training because sport is unilateral by nature. Very few sports are entirely bilateral and symmetrical ex with the exception maybe of the strength sports. And I don't know, I think that's it. Like even, even in sagittal plane only sports like running, I mean, it's locomotion. So it's one leg at a time. Um, so I think unilateral training is great and it can often be used to reduce bilateral asymmetries or as a rehab rehabilitation tool. So two important terms to know, one is the bilateral deficit. This is when there are asymmetries in force production between unilateral and bilateral movements. So what does this mean? This means that you can, let's say you can back squat and produce, I don't know, uh, 4,000 newtons of force when you back squat. But let's say that you could single leg squat and produce 3,000 newtons of force on each leg. Well, there's going to be a difference, like a deficit, a bilateral deficit of 2,000 pounds because 3,000 plus 3,000 is 6,000, but with both legs together at the same time, you can only produce 4,000. That's the bilateral deficit. Each leg on its own can produce more force than both legs together. And we often see this in untrained individuals because they don't yet have the ability for their, um, for their central nervous system to really unlock the full force production of both legs at the same time. Uh, something in the central governing processes in their brain is limiting their force production when they're doing it bilaterally. And so we call that the bilateral deficit. There's also bilateral facilitation. This is an increase in voluntary activation of the agonist muscles during bilateral movements. So this is when the person is stronger bilaterally than unilaterally and stronger individuals tend to have more of a bilateral facilitation. Now in some of my research and in testing hundreds of athletes on things like isometric mid thigh pulls and iso squats and in vertical jumps, I see the vast majority of athletes that I've tested having a bilateral deficit. The majority of them cannot produce this uh, more force bilaterally than they can unilaterally. But part of that is because I'm testing primarily collegiate athletes who they're a little bit uh, less far along in their development than, than, than a pro athlete. And they're all team sport athletes. So soccer players, baseball players, basketball players, volleyball players, and strength might not, or is definitely not the primary fitness characteristic that they're all training for. Yes, they should be strong, but they're not gonna be like power lifters strong. Now the key point here is that trained or stronger individuals have been theorized to exhibit bilateral facilitation 
while untrained, injured, or weaker athletes exhibit a bilateral deficit. So I guess most of the athletes I've worked with have not been in that strong category, but I would say you have to be really strong to exhibit a bilateral facilitation. I don't know if I could, um, I haven't tested that. That would be interesting. Let me know if you want me to test whether or not I have a bilateral deficit um, and post it here for you. But with that said, that's the end of this chapter, chapter 16, all about alternative and non-traditional modes of resistance training. So let me know if you guys have questions down in the comments. I'd be happy to answer them and engage with you there. Otherwise, check out some of the other resources on my channel. And I've also just started a new series of videos getting you ready to take the one and only sports science certification put out by the NSCA, the CPSS exam. So if you're keen on sports science, head over to that playlist and check out those videos. I have four or five of them published. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on the next video.